The sound of the phone ringing broke my concentration on World War II. My wife Joy, who has no interest in anything military-related, was away for a fortnight at her annual conference. I am an avid lover of the history of the Second World War, and I have a collection of all the films ever made about this war. I watch them when she's not around, usually during her hen nights or Saturday shopping trips with her friend Amanda. Twice a year she goes away for a long time, once in August for a corporate meeting in Indianapolis, and another time in February for a general meeting, like this year's in Houston. Only the most qualified employees are selected from each state, and for the past three years, Joy has been among those chosen. Last year, she got a week's holiday in Miami, allowing us to escape the harsh Colorado winter. While she's away, I find solace in watching war films. That Saturday, I immersed myself in The Dirty Dozen, Enemy at the Gates, and Saving Private Ryan. As I made a sandwich and settled down to watch Brothers in Arms, the phone rang and interrupted my viewing. Partly I was annoyed by this interruption, but secretly I hoped it was Joy calling with some interesting news. To my surprise, the voice on the other end of the line belonged to a woman. Hello, I'm looking for Roger Rigby, she said. I'm Roger. How can I help you? I replied. Mr. Rigby, this is Detective Desiree Phillips from the Vail Police Department. Your wife was in a car accident and is now in critical condition at Eagle Valley Medical Center. You need to get here as soon as possible. I was stunned. I think you're mistaken. My wife is in Houston for a conference, I said. When was the last time you spoke to her? Asked Detective Phillips. Last night. She called me after the meeting, I replied. The detective scrutinized Joy's driving license address and discovered that it matched our own. This discovery left me puzzled. How could the detective have Joy's license if she was calling from Houston? The only explanation that occurred to me was that her purse had been stolen, perhaps at the airport. The thought occurred to me. Should I press charges? The detective informed me that I could indeed press charges, but only after I arrived at the station, checked Joy's belongings, and gave a signed statement. Also, if Joy was my wife, my consent for any necessary medical attention would be required. Reluctantly, I gathered my things and headed to the station. As I drove, two possibilities swirled in my mind. Either someone had stolen Joy's wallet and was now gone to enjoy a ski trip, or there was a more sinister explanation behind the mysterious circumstances. Joy was suddenly in Vail instead of attending her convention in Houston. I couldn't understand why she decided to be in Vail unless she had won a trip or decided to go skiing without informing me. Despite my doubts, I had no concrete evidence to confirm her whereabouts in Houston. The thought occurred to me, what if she didn't get on the plane at all and went straight to Vail? I felt confused and worried about her safety. I hadn't noticed any signs of Joy's infidelity. Her attitude towards me hadn't changed. Had her style changed? No, she continued to wear the same outfits. Has she changed her hair or makeup? No, she still looks like she did in the 90s. She doesn't receive mysterious phone calls, display rude behaviors, or refuse intimate moments. There are no signs of mood swings or infidelity. The only questionable aspect is the time spent in Vail. As I walked down the pass towards Vail, I thought about the possibility of her infidelity. If she really is cheating, I will end our relationship. I will not tolerate infidelity in my life. My mother cheated on my father as a result of which he watched her every move and eventually forced her to quit her job. Their tumultuous relationship continued until I graduated from high school, and then they finally divorced. My father never fully recovered from the betrayal and eventually retired after a breakdown. I promised myself that I would never allow myself to be in a situation like this. My brother Daniel, on the other hand, went to more extreme measures when he found out that his wife was cheating. As a result, he dealt with both her and her lover, and ended up in prison himself. I don't want to follow in his footsteps either. I know that I need to find a balance between being overly trusting and overly suspicious. I refuse to let other people dictate to me how to live my life. If she turns out to be unfaithful, 
I will end the relationship peacefully. As I got closer to Vale, my anxiety grew. It wasn't difficult to find the hospital, so I headed for the entrance. Since I got married, I've only been drinking beer, but now I wanted Jack Daniels. I found out the room number at the information desk and went to the intensive care unit. The nurse at the reception clarified who I came to and contacted someone to let me through. I was greeted by a petite blonde nurse. She has suffered serious injuries and her appearance can change a lot. She won't be able to hear you, but I think it's necessary to warn you about it, the nurse said. When I approached the figure lying on the bed, it dawned on me that I might not even recognize her. My voice trembled when I asked to open the door to the room. The woman in front of me looked like my wife, tall and strong, but her face was completely unfamiliar. I couldn't help but wonder if she had fallen in a skiing accident, possibly crashing into a tree on the mountain. When I asked about this, the nurse informed me that she had been attacked and left in an ambulance earlier that day. I thought that faithful wives are not left alone in ambulances, and I doubted whether the woman lying in front of me was really my wife. The uncertainty did not leave me when I expressed my doubts to the nurse. In an attempt to clarify the situation, the nurse lifted the blanket, revealing Jiminy Cricket's tattoo on the woman's left thigh. Then I knew for sure that this was my wife. This tattoo, a symbol of her love for Jiminy Cricket and a tribute to her parents Jim and Yvonne, has always remained a mystery to me. When I looked at her, it was difficult for me to combine the woman lying in front of me with the image of my wife. The first time I saw my wife in trouble coincided with our first meeting. It happened at the Tool concert, where my friends and I brought a case of beer to celebrate the end of the concert. A girl came up to us and asked for a beer for her boyfriend, but my friend Chad kindly offered her a drink. Later I heard a scream and saw a smaller man hitting on the same girl. Without hesitation I intervened, separated them, and ordered him to retreat. Despite his threats, I managed to cope with the situation. Then I escorted the girl to our van, where Chad gave her an ice pack. A security team arrived and took the man away. A girl with an amazing face and contact lenses expressed her gratitude to me. We gave her ice and escorted her safely home. Chad playfully teased me, suggesting that she might like me, and cunningly handed me a note with her number signed as Joy. Two days later, I plucked up the courage and called her. To my delight, she was glad to hear from me, and we talked for an hour. She called me back in the evening. Our first date took place on Friday at an Italian restaurant and bar with live music. It was a fantastic evening. On the first date, I did not make love and expressed my doubts to her, after which I kissed her on the cheek and went home. Our schedules didn't match for three weeks before we were able to meet again. Despite frequent phone conversations, it was not easy to find time for a meeting. Eventually, after her aunt's funeral, we decided to go to the cinema. When I came to pick her up, her father met me inside, and I didn't know what to expect. Nice to meet you, Roger. I'm Jim, he greeted me, and then asked me what I do and if I've always lived in Springs. Then his tone became serious. Listen, son. It seems that you are much more suitable for joy than this inadequate guy. It's a pity that he doesn't want to come here and meet me face to face. He met with me, and I hope he's smart enough to stay away, I said with a grin. Yes, and I hope so, Jim snapped. Joy came in a minute later, beaming and hugging me. She was dressed to impress, accentuating her curves. I almost revised my rule of waiting three dates before getting intimate, but we decided to wait until the next date. She had an early work day the next morning. The following Friday, we went to dinner. When we were returning home, Joy urgently needed to go to the toilet. Fortunately, my apartment was nearby and I brought her there. After the toilet, she came out in nothing but red underwear and high-heeled boots, inviting me to have fun. As a result, I only kept my coat on that evening. The next morning, we had breakfast at a nearby cafe and spent the rest of the weekend together. Before I took her home, she jokingly threatened her boss with dismissal if he forced her to work on weekends again. She laughed at missing the meeting with me and gave me a mischievous look. 
At the hospital, a nurse handed me Joy's personal belongings, and I signed some papers. The phone buzzed, and the nurse handed me the receiver. Detective Phillips asked me to come to the police station to answer a few questions. I agreed, took the address, thanked the nurse, and left. An inner voice told me that the police believed that I had harmed her. I arrived at the police station at sunset, and after I introduced myself, I was greeted by Detective Phillips and Deputy Devon. Phillips looked friendly and Devon looked suspicious, as if he expected me to do something illegal. Do I need a lawyer? I asked. Do you think you need him? Asked Phillips. No, I have nothing to hide, I assured her. Then she took me into a room and started recording our conversation. I apologize for not believing you on the phone. I mistook you for a friend who interrupted my personal time, I said. What is my time? Phillips asked. This is when I watch films about the Second World War, I explained. Joy doesn't like them, so I indulge in them when she's not at home, I added. Devin's deputy came in and sat down in a chair while Detective Phillips prepared to start the dictaphones. Are we ready? She asked, flicking a switch on the wall. For the record... This is Detective Desiree Phillips, who is conducting an interview with Mr. Roger Rigby on the case of victim Joy Tanya Rigby. Mr. Rigby, please state your name, age, and date of birth, she instructed. I am Roger Ezekiel Rigby, 35 years old, born on December 16th, I replied. Now please tell me your address and occupation, Detective Phillips asked. Phillips asked, Where were you from 6 in the evening to 8 in the morning? I replied, from nine in the morning to seven in the evening, I was in Manitou Springs, repairing the fireplace. Then I went to Jerry's bar and stayed there until 11 at night. I returned home at 11.30 in the evening and stayed there until your call. Then Phillips asked, can anyone confirm your location? Paul Hannibal from Jerry and my neighbor Stephen Harper can confirm that I was at home at midnight, three in the morning and six in the morning, I began. How can Stephen Harper confirm this? Deputy Devon intervened. We both have dogs that need to be walked at the same time. Stephen is a night owl and always comes out to say hello when he sees me, I replied. They were silent for a moment. Then Phillips continued. When was the last time you saw your wife? Phillips asked. Why did your wife have to fly to Houston? Phillips asked. To my company's annual general meeting, I replied. Only the best employees are present, and she has been participating in it for the third year, I quickly added. Then Phillips asked, And what does your wife do? I replied, She sells life insurance for TransUnited. Do you know the commercial where the old man tells the child to be ready for the inevitable? I hate these ads. They both nodded understandingly. I feel sick every time it's shown. Anyway, she was supposed to fly to Houston, I added. Phillips asked, and you escorted her to the airport? I explained what I was planning, but we had to go back because she forgot her bag. As a result, due to the delay, I dropped her off later than I expected, as I had to rush to work. Phillips asked how my wife could have forgotten her luggage, to which I replied that she thought I had put it in the car when I was warming it up. When I went to start the car, her bag was still lying open on the bed, and I realized that it was missing only when we were already on the road. Then Phillips asked me how often my wife travels for work. I replied, twice a year, two weeks in February for a general meeting, and two weeks in August for a training session in Indianapolis. Then Phillips asked, does the meeting always take place in Houston? I replied, no, everything is changing. Joy was in Los Angeles and New York last year. Devin asked, Mr. Rigby, do you know anyone who would want to harm your wife? I replied, no, except maybe a few of her clients. Then Devin asked, why do they want to harm her? The sales tactics of this company may alarm some people. Most of their clients first sign up for a free information kit for children, and then they are offered life insurance, I explained. Devin asked if there were client meetings in Vail, to which I replied that she should actually be in Houston. Phillips then asked if I knew anyone she might be with, which led me to mention her colleagues who might have information about her whereabouts. After a moment of silence, 
Devin looked at Phillips, and she gave him the go-ahead to leave. Phillips then asked if I planned to return home that night, to which I replied that I would find a motel. When I left, their parting words were the predictable, we'll be in touch. When I returned to the hospital, I was overwhelmed by a wave of uncertainty. Did Joy cheat on me? Just a week ago, I was saying goodbye to her at the airport when she boarded a flight to Houston, and now I found her chained to a hospital bed in Vail, Colorado. Upon arrival at the hospital, I was informed that visiting hours were over, but I could return at 7 the next morning. In search of a place to stay for the night, I asked the guard to suggest a hotel. With a touch of humor, he noted that during the ski season, the most affordable option is often to spend the night with relatives. I laughed at the joke and went back out into the cool night air. While sorting through Joy's things, I came across an inventory sheet that caught my attention. Among her belongings, I found a prescription bottle containing five Percocet tablets left over from recent root canal treatment. Intrigued by this find, I decided to search her shoes, as I knew that she often hides things in the inner flap. To my surprise, I found the key card, although it was of the usual white color and had no distinguishing marks indicating belonging to a particular room. Continuing the investigation, I realized that a mobile phone was missing from Joy's purse, which was not listed in the inventory. Fortunately, my neighbor Stephen, who works as a software developer, provided me with an application that allows me to track her phone using GPS. After entering her number into the app, it showed that her phone was four miles northeast of my current location. Following the directions of the app, I drove towards the mountain and eventually reached a road strewn with luxury ski lodges at the base of the resort. When I got closer, the app showed that I was only half a mile away from the phone. There were a lot of expensive cars around, like Lexuses and Audis, and I was grateful that I decided to drive Joy's BMW instead of my old SUV. As I drove up to the house, I noticed that it had two entrances. I walked through the reception area and headed straight for the hall. I was overcome by a feeling of anxiety. The indicator on Joy's phone pointed to the number 114, but the key card did not give me access. Room 214 didn't give any results either. Not knowing what to do next, I reached for number 314. Pressing my ear to the door, I didn't hear anything, and then I gently pushed it open. The room was in semi-darkness, and I had to turn on the light. Despite the emptiness, there were traces of the previous guest's stay in the air. Joy's suitcase, phone charger, and laptop were neatly laid out on the table. The room looked extraordinarily clean, as if someone had tried to keep it untouched rather than professionally cleaned. Despite this, there were wet towels in the bathroom and wet stains on the sink, indicating recent use. There were signs of sleep on the bed, but there were no signs of anxiety or cruelty. Concerned, I decided to investigate further by checking Joy's phone and laptop. To my surprise, her phone was not password protected, and when I examined the laptop, I found that all records and emails had been mysteriously erased, a behavior completely uncharacteristic of joy. Without hesitation, I contacted my sister Beth and asked her to look after the dog, and then called my father-in-law Jim asking for help. After that, I turned to my cousin Hugh, who works as a detective, for advice. He advised me to contact the Vale Police, when I called the reception of the lodge, they confirmed that the guest was not registered under either Joy's name or her maiden name. It became clear that Joy's laptop and phone had been wiped off the face of the earth. I decided to take them to Stephen and Joe, who are experienced programmers. After checking Joy's suitcase, I found mostly cocktail dresses and underwear in it, not work clothes, which indicated that she was not on a business trip. I took a shower took Joy's phone and laptop, left my suitcase and settled into an armchair for the night. The next morning, after drinking a cup of coffee, I dialed Detective Phillips' number. Despite feeling terrible, I was grateful that my sarcastic side remained intact. Phillips picked up the phone, apparently already awake. Detective Phillips, 
This is Roger Rigby. Last night I found a hotel key card in my wife's things. I thought she might be useful to the cause. She expressed her gratitude and arranged to meet me in half an hour. After wandering aimlessly around Vale for 25 minutes, I finally decided to go to the police station. Detective Phillips greeted me when I entered and shook my hand. Hello, Mr. Rigby, she said. Good morning, I replied, handing her the key card. Here she is. Then she invited me to go to her office, where she noticed the suffering on my face. You look like your world has collapsed. You need to rest, the detective informed me. I admitted that I had found the number on Joy's phone, and she seemed relieved that I hadn't touched the bed. I handed Joy's phone to her, deciding not to mention the laptop. What are your next steps, Mr. Rigby? Detective Phillips asked. I'm not sure. I'm afraid I might lose my wife because of this. I want to hear her explanations, but I'm not sure I can trust them, I said. Don't lose hope. Perhaps there is a reasonable explanation that has nothing to do with infidelity, she suggested, although there was doubt in her expression. I expressed my gratitude and went to the hospital to wait for the next visit to the intensive care unit. After two short visits, when I was already hoping that Joy would wake up, the doctor appeared. Dr. Benson, who looked like a quarterback, came up to me. The doctor assured me that Joy was on the mend, but recommended that she be transferred to St. Luke's Hospital in Denver for more complete rehabilitation. He explained that her injuries were most likely caused by a blow to the head, and I agreed to her transportation. But later, he decided to change his plans and transfer her to St. Augustine Hospital in Colorado Springs, which would be closer to visiting relatives. I signed additional papers, paid one last visit, and then left feeling insecure about my future without Joy. Reflecting on the situation, I couldn't help but wonder why Joy was in such a state, and what secrets could have led us to this. It was obvious that our marriage was facing problems that we might not have fully guessed about. I'm not ready to file for divorce until we talk, but I feel like our relationship is coming to an end, I thought with tears in my eyes as I left the hospital. I called Jim to tell him the latest news, and when I got home, my sister's Jeep was parked at the entrance. Inside, my Doberman Piper met me, followed by Beth. I hugged her tightly pouring out my emotions about the impending end of my marriage. Beth stayed with me for several hours, comforting me and offering me dinner, but I had no appetite. Together, we decided to visit Jim. I opened up to him and Yvonne, sharing everything that was in my heart. Jim looked unsure of his daughter's innocence, and I've seen that look before. After months of dating Joy, she once canceled a weekend date. I was disappointed, but I understood her. I was about to hang up the phone when I heard Jim's voice. Tell that son of a cow he'd better meet me. Joey made an obscene sound and told me not to pay attention to him, and then hung up. I was worried about why he was mad at me. Ten minutes later, I was standing on the porch of her house, and Jim was shouting in my face, You're no better than that little scoundrel. If you think it's necessary to punish my daughter, then be a man and punish me, Jim said and there was anger in his voice. What? Why should I punish your daughter? I exclaimed, stunned by such a suggestion. She didn't even go outside last night, Jim reported. What gives you the right to think that? I asked. Do you think you're cool now? Jim said. Why are you so quick to resort to punishment? I asked. The only person I raised my hand against was that idiot Garrett at the concert the night I met Joy. I haven't even seen Joy since last weekend. We hardly even see each other during the week. Before you accuse me, you need to sort out the facts, I added rudely. At that moment, the tension was great. Emotions were raging. When Joy and Yvonne left the house, I immediately noticed that Joy had a black eye. Worried, I asked quietly, What happened to your eye, dear? Jim angrily intervened, accusing me of being the one to blame. Before I could defend myself, Joy spoke up, explaining that she had quarreled with Garrett during dinner the night before. I was shocked to learn that Joy continues to date Garrett. I abruptly turned around and went to my car. Joy called out to me, but I didn't react. 
Jim caught up with me and apologized on Joy's behalf. I understand your anger, Jim, I replied, assuring him that it was just dinner. Joy, I'm sorry that you got hurt again, but we're breaking up, I said firmly, looking at Joy and staying with my decision. Ignoring any reactions, I drove without direction until I found myself near Garrett's trailer park. After parking the car, I went to his door and knocked. When Garrett answered, I let my anger get the better of me and hit him. He fell to the ground and I kept hitting him until he stopped moving. I noticed the collected boxes and asked, Are you moving? Without waiting for an answer, I kicked him again and then left. When I got home, I applied ice to the damaged knuckles. The phone rang and Joy's pleading voice reached my ears. I ended the conversation without saying a word. After an hour of continuous calls, my cousin Hugh finally got through to me. He informed me that the CSPD police had been contacted with concerns about the safety of Garrett Jimenez. I brushed off the news by telling Hugh that I wasn't interested in Jimenez. But Hugh continued to insist, saying that Jimenez was found in serious condition after being attacked by a mysterious criminal. Despite the fact that I denied any involvement in this case, Hugh noted that the caller gave my name, which prompted the police to contact me. Thanking Hugh for the warning, I joked that I needed a reliable alibi. When the police showed up, I had everything ready. My hockey gear was neatly laid out by the door, and there was a small scratch on my slightly swollen knuckles. The officer didn't show much interest in catching the man who attacked Garrett, so I quickly explained that my hands hurt from working with hockey gear. Being on a police-sponsored hockey team also helped me. I spent Saturday on the ice, skating to exhaustion, preparing for the upcoming season. Since one of our leading defenders is no longer on the team, I knew I would get more playing time. When I finally got home, I was exhausted, but I was happy with how I spent the day. There were a lot of notes left on my door, mostly from Joy. Among them was a note from Jim apologizing for suggesting that I might hurt Joy and urging me not to get upset about her. I called Jim and assured him that I understood his reaction, saying, You reacted the way any caring father would? It's not your fault that Joy didn't confess right away. Jim seemed relieved by my words and asked, Would you like to talk to Joy? Even though I could hear Joy's voice in the background, I refused, saying, No, Jim, she decided to follow Garrett's advice and let you know that I hit her. She ruined our plans for the evening to hide her injury. When I told Jim and Yvonne about everything related to Vale, Jim seemed to be lost in memories of the past. Jim expressed concern about my impulsive actions. I assured him that I was in no hurry to hire lawyers, but she needed an explanation. Jim and Yvonne insisted that they saw me as a son and didn't want to cut me out of their lives. I promised them that this would not happen. On the way home, Beth asked me how I was feeling. I replied, do I really have a choice? I refuse to curl up and die, I told her firmly. When Beth asked if Joy and I would stay together if she cheated, I made it clear that I would not become a paranoid husband who resorts to GPS trackers and spy cameras. Mom asked about you, Beth mentioned, suggesting that it would be nice to talk to her since she loves you. But I quickly rejected this idea, stating, for her to tell me that cheating is okay and I should share my wife, no thanks. If there's anyone I shouldn't talk to, it's her. Beth was always protective of our mom, but I stood my ground on this issue. When Daniel was imprisoned, she urged me to visit him more often. Beth stubbornly defended him, and I decided to leave. Beth accused me of being rude, but I stood my ground, saying I couldn't put up with infidelity. I don't want you to make hasty decisions, Beth warned me. Don't worry, I'll get more information first, I reassured her. After Beth dropped me off, I went to Stephen and Joe's house. Stephen wasted no time analyzing Joy's laptop. I gave them the latest news, and Stephen asked me to leave the laptop for a day or two for further investigation. Joe offered to set me up with his cousin. Joe, if your cousin doesn't have a sea breast volume, then I'm not interested, I teased. Rude, he chuckled. Joe always liked to make me blush, but I was not embarrassed by his and Stephen's open attitude to explicit topics. I stayed for a beer with Joe while Stephen fiddled with his laptop. 
Joe left for work early, playfully mentioning his attractive neighbor. I thought Mrs. Jasper had been a widow for a long time, I commented. Joe laughed and wished me good night. Stephen barely glanced at me as I left. I started my day at home by taking Piper outside to do her chores and play a little. In winter, she usually gets tired after three throws. Back at the house, I climbed into bed and called Piper to me. Although Joy didn't approve of Piper sleeping in a bed, I didn't mind. Piper may be bothering me to sleep, but I can't blame all my bad dreams on her. The next morning, I sipped my coffee and tried to focus on the sports section until 8. By 9 o'clock, I was in Bernie Jag's office. Bernie was Joy's boss. What can I do for you, Roger? He asked. Is there any reason why Joy can leave the convention in Houston and go to Vail? I asked. Why does Joy have to be in Houston? He asked, perplexed. For your company's general meeting? I explained. Roger, the meeting in Houston was for novice agents, not for the best. Joy, as a managing agent, is usually not involved. I only send her if I can't find a volunteer. Joy never goes to meetings, he replied. I was stunned and even angrier. What about the training in Indianapolis? I asked. Bernie explained that his managing agents usually attend such events, but leave on Sunday and return on Thursday. It dawned on me that Joy took a two-week vacation and stayed somewhere else. Curious, I asked about her companions. Who are they? I asked. Bernie hesitated, demanding that I promise not to harm them before carefully revealing their identities. I just need answers, Bernie. My wife is in a coma, I replied. After some hesitation, he finally told me who Joy was with, and I was surprised by the unexpected name. It took an hour before my cousin Hugh called me. The identity of the person who rented Joy's room has been established. We plan to bring him in for questioning. Can I be present when I talk to Cal? Hugh asked. Of course, I replied. I've already gathered valuable information from Joy's boss, Bernie Jags. I'll let you know when we schedule an interview, I added. After that, I spent the rest of the day in the hospital with a team of brain injury specialists. As much as I wanted to leave Joy to her fate, I knew I needed more proof. Jim and Yvonne showed up before Joy's transfer, and I told them what I had learned. Jim couldn't believe what was happening, and Yvonne begged him to delay making a decision. I swore not to hurt Joy. Can you forgive her? Yvonne asked. I'm not sure. I do not know if I can trust her. I replied. But you gave her another chance, Yvonne said. Yes, but we weren't married then. And she wasn't cheating on me at the time, Jim clarified. After the conflict with Garrett, I didn't see Joy for three weeks. I haven't been in touch with her for two weeks. After I finally discovered my missed calls, I realized that we had never considered our relationship exclusive. It was a disturbing discovery which was compounded by the fact that Joy had led her father to believe that I had hit her, a clear sign of trouble to come. When I returned home after hockey practice, I just wanted to take a hot shower and drink painkillers. But when I got to the door, she was standing there. You're not answering your phone, Joy said. Is that why you came here? I snapped irritably. Do you really have to be so rude? She replied. I missed you, Joy confessed. You didn't miss me. Or maybe I missed you, but only because your boyfriend is still in bed, I replied. So you're annoyed with Garrett, she concluded. I never said that. What really makes me angry is that you let your father believe that I slapped you, I stated firmly. When I entered, I realized that she had followed me. She started to speak, but I interrupted her. We never decided to be exclusive, so I can't get upset that you're sleeping with him. I'm angry at myself for not seeing the truth. I foolishly thought that if I was sleeping with a girl, then we were dating until we decided otherwise, I said. I dropped my things and continued. We had good times. Don't you like that I'm not cruel or an idiot? Do you need a paranoid outcast who can't meet your physical needs and ends up attacking you? Come on, enjoy it. Maybe I'll even send you a brass knuckle as a wedding gift, I said rudely. Have you finished yet? She asked defiantly with tears in her eyes. I've had enough. Why are you still here? I replied. Listen, you fool. I'm sorry that I made my father think that you had offended me. 
I canceled our date so you wouldn't do something that could get you arrested. I accidentally left my phone at home when I went to Garrett's, she explained. I've had enough. I don't need these stupid explanations, I said, trying to steer the conversation in another direction. No, you have to listen to me, she insisted. I visited Garrett because he was moving to Wyoming. He urged me to join him, but I refused. In response, he attacked me. I took refuge with my friend Julie. I came back home to contact you so that you would not come into conflict with him. Unfortunately, my father saw my bruised face before I could explain everything, she explained, her voice trembling. Okay, I've listened to you. Now I have a steamed shower waiting for me, I added. Her expression changed, but when the word shower left my lips, she looked completely depressed. I don't know exactly why I asked this, but it flashed through my mind. Do you want to join me? She answered yes, without hesitation. That same evening, we decided to devote ourselves exclusively to each other. Just three weeks later, she moved in with me, and eight months later, we got married. Memories of Garrett surfaced when we learned of his tragic death in a car accident in Laramie, Wyoming. Together with a close friend, she attended his funeral for two days. Now, ten years later, Joy was in a coma at St. Augustine's Hospital. The doctors did not lose hope for her recovery while we anxiously waited in the hospital waiting room. Thirty long minutes later, we still haven't received any information about her condition. Hugh informed me that the interview with Cal Davis would take place at four o'clock. I quickly informed Jim and Yvonne that I had an appointment and left. When I got home, I let Piper out while I was getting dressed in a suit and tie. If Sheriff Jeb Hannibal had allowed me to attend the interrogation, I knew I had to be dressed appropriately. Jeb was an old acquaintance of mine because my father worked with him, and I was the best friend of his son, Paul. Paul and I were inseparable, playing football and hockey together until Jeb became sheriff and moved closer to the office. Despite the fact that Paul and I expected to make a career in professional hockey, life turned out differently. After my father's death when I was still a student, I lost my passion for the game and eventually decided to drop out of school to pursue a career as a bricklayer. Paul's hockey career was also cut short when he broke his hip during his junior season. Now he works for the Colorado Springs Police and devotes his time to training for young people. Upon arrival at the sheriff's office, Hugh met me, and Zeke from the Vail Police Department joined us via video link. I was told to sit where they couldn't see me, and Jeb reminded me that I shouldn't say anything that could jeopardize the case. I assured them that I understood everything and promised not to engage in any attacks. Nora and I are here for you and ready to support you every step of the way, the sheriff assured me. If you need anything, just let me know, he added. When we headed to the interrogation rooms, I immediately noticed Catherine Shepard. She looked even more beautiful than at school. She always seemed out of reach to me, the prom queen and the cheerleader who dated the quarterback of the school, while I was just a quarterback on the hockey team. I couldn't help but wonder if she had married a successful doctor or lawyer when she was ushered into the room. Stop drooling. Hugh said, leading me inside. Sheriff Jeb Hannibal was smiling broadly. I've always wanted to do this, he exclaimed, pulling a badge out of his pocket. I'm appointing you as a deputy sheriff so that only law enforcement officers are in this room. After forcing me to take the oath, he stressed the importance of returning the badge before I left. Before parting, he hugged me and expressed hope for my future, saying, I hope you get your degree, and one day join me in the police. Your father was an excellent officer, and I believe that you will become one too. Hugh and I left Jeb's office, and I kept thinking about Catherine Shepard, and wondering if she would have been unfaithful if I had been with her. It seems that in my family, all women cheat on men when it comes to marriage. When we entered the interrogation room, Hugh directed me to a chair away from the camera's view. Detective Phillips and another officer joined us via video link. Then the deputy sheriff brought in Hal Davis, who turned out to be an agile and talkative man. Hugh began the interrogation by saying, 
Mr. Davis, this interrogation is being recorded. Hal replied calmly. Of course, no problem. For the record, Detective Hugh McMillan of the El Paso County Sheriff's Department is present for questioning, as well as Detectives Keith Douglas and Roger Riggs. During a video conference, Detective Desiree Phillips and Detective Ron Albert from the Vail Police Department interrogate Mr. Davis. He confirms that he understands his rights and agrees to speak without a lawyer. As they continue to ask the usual questions, Davis begins to doubt that suspect Cal is responsible for Joy's punch. Cal looks too well-groomed and rich, and he's wearing an engagement ring that probably costs more than Davis's truck. Mr. Davis, could you tell us about your whereabouts from Monday to Sunday? Phillips asked. Yes, of course. From Monday to Friday, I was in Houston for a meeting of our company, Cal replied. On Friday evening, I returned home and spent the weekend with my wife, he added. So you were in a meeting all week? Yes, Cal replied confidently. This makes the task easier. We just need to check with your employer, Philip said. The confident smile on Cal's face faded when Hugh mentioned the call to Bernie Jags. Wait, Cal said, his self-confidence gone. Can I tell you something without my wife's knowledge? Cal admitted that the affair with Joy lasted for more than six years, and he was seized with fear when he found out about Joy's disappearance, or that she might be harmed. He remembered dropping her off at the terminal, where she said she was flying to Denver to meet her husband. Cal insisted that his wife could vouch for his whereabouts at home since Friday evening. After further questioning, Hugh signed a decree and allowed Cal to leave, warning him not to leave the city. Can I have a few minutes alone with Detective Riggs? Cal asked Hugh. You can ask, but there are no guarantees, Hugh replied. Hugh looked at me and I agreed. I sat down across from Cal, who looked broken and depressed, a stark contrast to the confident man who had entered the room 40 minutes ago. So, Roger, do we need an official introduction? Cal asked. Obviously not. You seem to know who I am, I replied. Joy keeps your photo in her presentation set and on her desk. She loves you, you know, Cal reported. No, I don't understand that. If Joy loved me, we wouldn't be here, I replied. The problem is I love her too, Cal said. Well, at least four weeks a year. I bet your wife doesn't think too highly of your love, I said sarcastically. I love her, Roger. And I also love my wife. She knows about my crush on Joy. I realized Joy was special when I interviewed her. I felt like I had to become her handler, Cal said. One Saturday we had lunch near the army base. There was a strong bond between us that led us to a hotel room, but after that we didn't have an intimate relationship for a month. I feel guilty, but I'm attracted to her, you know? Not guilty enough to stop, right? I said sarcastically. It's not a cheap pleasure such meetings with joy, Cal defended himself. I'm sorry that your fabulous bubble burst. I replied mockingly. Despite my anger, Cal stated that he did not regret loving Joy. I couldn't believe the nonsense he was talking. I wanted to hit him, but I restrained myself. It wouldn't have brought me any relief. It was hard for me to share Joy with you, but now she's all yours, Cal said. So you're giving up on her because she loves me? I asked. Do you think I would share a woman like Joy if I knew she loved someone else? Cal replied, I have no idea. If I had known, our relationship would have ended sooner. After all, I don't approve of cheating, I said firmly. Cal nodded in agreement. You're probably right, Cal said. Is that why you and my wife went on these trips to hide infidelity? I asked. Joy and I visited Mexico City, San Diego and Rio, as well as Corpus Christi and Miami. Plans to visit Vail and Estes Park were thwarted due to the high cost of additional trips. I can't know what Joy was doing in Vail, Cal said. Joy and I both felt guilty, so we decided to arrange a vacation for our spouses. Joy suggested that you join her for the second week, and I returned home. We would spend one week together and then switch places. I returned home and she spent the second week with you, and so it is every time we meet. And it's all at my expense, Cal explained. But it's pointless. Joy went away for two weeks each time, and I was with her in Miami for only one week, I replied. 
Was Joy cheating on me? Cal asked and started crying. She cheated on you. She cheated on me. If you want to visit her, Joy is in St. Augustine at Oaks S right now. Give her my regards, I said rudely. When I went to the door, he hesitated and asked, You won't tell my wife, will you? I answered firmly, I do not know your wife, and if I did, I would not offend her. No, I won't tell her. I threw him a warning. It's better to know that guilt will eat you alive, but it's not like that. Traitors have no conscience. Someday you will answer for this. When I left, Hugh was waiting for me in the hallway and expressed his sympathy. Hey friend, I'm really sorry. I thought we caught this guy. How could this happen right under my nose all this time? I exclaimed irritably. There was a sudden commotion and we turned to see Catherine Shepard slapping Cal. You're a worthless, crooked-armed idiot! Don't come home, Calvin! I don't want to see you anymore! She screamed, tears streaming down her face. When the deputy pulled her away, she looked at me and hugged me tightly. I'm so sorry, she sobbed. It's not your fault or mine, I reassured her. It's just that we both chose the wrong people, I added. Wiping a tear from her cheek, I said a few words of comfort. I hope you will succeed. Gathering her thoughts, she replied, I wish you all the best too, Roger. After kissing me on the cheek, she turned to leave, accompanied by her brother James, whom I had known since high school. It suddenly dawned on me why she was at the sheriff's station. Turning to my friend Hugh, I shared my realization. She's at his house, and he's looking for pleasure elsewhere. Hugh simply replied, Some men need what they can't have. I stopped by Jeb's office to return my badge and listen to another lecture about completing my studies and a career in law enforcement. Although I had heard all this before, a small voice inside me suggested that I might be missing something important. The following days were filled with stress while I was looking for a lawyer to represent my interests in the upcoming divorce. After careful consideration, I decided to hire a firm in Denver that specialized in men's cases, which guaranteed me protection during the process. Fortunately, Joy and I did not have children together, and although Piper was my responsibility, the house legally belonged to Joy's grandmother, although it originally belonged to Jim. After my father died, my brother and I inherited his house. Daniel, my brother, lived there with his wife and paid my rent. When Daniel discovered that his wife was cheating on him, he took action and dealt with her and her lover. Then her family tried to take the house away, but fortunately my lawyer was able to step in and save it. As a result, the court ruled that most of the house belongs to me thanks to Daniel's rent payments. Despite winning the court case, Joy was furious about the money I spent on legal fees, but I stood my ground and didn't let the crooks take over my father's house. Looking back, her anger should have been a warning sign. One late Tuesday, I went to the hospital where Jim was looking after his daughter. When he saw me, he shook his head, expressing either concern or expectation. It's been six years since she started her career in insurance, but it feels like a lot more time has passed. I admitted. Jim expressed his disappointment, unable to believe that his daughter could be so deceptive. I would never have married her if I had known, I added solemnly. After Jim shared with me everything he had told Calda, he understood why Joy stopped taking pictures during trips, unlike when she was younger. I made it clear that I couldn't bring myself to visit her in the hospital again. Understanding my feelings, Jim advised me to stay in the house until she was ready to return to avoid further trouble. I agreed to wait for her recovery before filing for divorce. I had a special bond with Jim and Yvonne, who always treated me like a son. On Wednesday, I spent the day repairing the chimney, and in the evening, I played hockey. I spent most of the first period in the penalty box due to rough play, which forced our coach, who was a friend of Paul, to put me on the bench to avoid being excluded from the league. Besides, we were losing, and I was in a bad mood. But my teammates were sympathetic to this, and offered to come into conflict with Cal on my behalf, although I refused. After returning home, Piper wanted to go outside. While she was running around, I made a mental note that I needed to inspect Dad's fence. From the next window, Stephen shouted that he would be heading there soon, 
probably with news of Joy's missing laptop. The night before, I searched our table for any hints or clues. After reviewing the accounts and bank statements, I did not find anything suspicious. How did she finance these excursions? I couldn't help but notice that before each trip she called her friend Fiona more often. But Fiona was silent whenever I asked. The fact that I had never met Fiona suddenly seemed strange to me. When I dialed her number, all I got was a voicemail greeting. I wished I had Joy's phone handy when Stephen came into the house looking worried. What did you find, Steve? I asked eagerly. Pour me a beer and I'll show you around, Stephen replied. I brought us a couple of beers and we sat down at the table while Stephen opened Joy's laptop. Whoever was erasing the tracks knew what they were doing, Stephen said. There are several programs here that I know you didn't install. No offense, Roger. You always assign me to handle your computer stuff, Stephen confusedly reported. I know I don't know anything about computers, so I'm not offended, I reassured him. After discovering a program that allows Joy to access the internet without leaving home, Stephen said that a friend from the Ministry of Defense helped him set it up. We found a lot of things, Stephen shared. Surprised, I asked if Joy was a computer genius. No, she just uses the same password for everything, Stephen clarified. I immediately thought of Fiona, who worked for a defense industry software company, as a possible culprit for such a complex setup. What was she hiding? I asked. She used masking programs for her email and bank account, Stephen replied. So that's how she paid for these trips, I mused. What kind of trips? Stephen asked, intrigued. I continued to tell Stephen what I had learned from Cal. When I finished, Stephen's eyes widened. Have you read the letter? I asked. I admit that I hacked the mail server and found deleted emails. There were love notes among them and some discussed a meeting in Vail, Stephen said. Curious, I asked about the identity of the sender. It turned out that some of the emails were addressed to Cal Davis, while others were sent to an email address marked Crycut. Stephen also said that in one of the emails the sender called him Garrett. Disappointed, I muttered a curse under my breath. Stephen agreed, acknowledging my disappointment. He then demonstrated how to access bank accounts and email accounts, secure them, and successfully restore them. Upon discovering a suspicious ATM withdrawal from Joy's bank account, of an amount exceeding $10,000 after her hospitalization, I immediately took action. I transferred the funds to our shared account, closed her individual account, and updated all contact information on my email. In the course of my investigation, I came across Fiona, but found no trace of her presence on social media. But while looking through Joy's school albums, I came across a familiar face Garrett, who turned out to be Fiona Jimenez's brother. When I realized the connection, I realized that I had to ask for help. Feeling guilty for waking her up, I dialed Detective Phillips number at 1 a.m. and explained the situation. Hello, Detective Phillips, she moaned back. This is Roger, I said. I'm listening to you, Roger, she said. I think I know who attacked my wife, I said. Interested, she listened intently as I explained the details of the bank account and described Garrett and the missing debit card that had been used that morning. Thank you, and don't worry about waking me up. You have a sharp eye for this kind of work, she praised in a more cheerful voice. I hear that a lot. Well, good night, I replied. She wished me good night and hung up. I couldn't help but feel envy and pity for her husband. I envied him, but at the same time I sympathized with him because of the stress of working in the police and its impact on family life. Some spouses are coping with this, but others, like my mom, are having difficulties. When my dog Piper whined, asking to go outside, I noticed Stephen on the porch. Hey Stephen, do you still have access to the DMV databases? I asked. Yes, damn it, I always have access, he replied confidently. Nice to hear, Mr. Hacker Deluxe, I teased him for his nickname in the chat, which he didn't seem offended by. I gave him a name to search for and wished him good night, confident that he would be happy to take up the case. Exhausted, I submitted to my body's need for sleep. The next morning, my sleep was interrupted by my father-in-law's call. Good morning, Roger, he greeted. 
Doctors are gradually reducing the dose of medications for Joy. They expect her to wake up within the next 24 hours, Jim informed me. Faster than I expected, I said, taken aback. I thought she would be in a coma for at least a week. Jim explained that they were encouraged by some positive test results. Then, out of the blue, he asked, Have you thought about forgiving her? No, I can't ignore the growing deception, I admitted. I told him everything, leaving out the secret bank account. He was crushed and abruptly interrupted the conversation, clearly disappointed. Just as I was making coffee, Stephen appeared. You won't believe what I've discovered, he exclaimed, overflowing with joy. Good morning, Steve. Doesn't Joe think it's weird that you're here at eight in the morning while he's at work? I teased. You're teasing him and he knows it. Stephen replied with a laugh. So what did you find? I asked, handing him a cup of coffee. He shared his findings, and it seemed to me that we had slipped down an endless rabbit hole. Joy was partially misled about attending Garrett's funeral. In fact, she went to Fiona's funeral instead. Fiona, Garrett's sister, was tragically killed in a car accident in Laramie, and it was most likely then that Joy began her affair after learning that Garrett was alive. The previous year, Joy called me in Miami when Garrett was in prison for petty theft and was on parole from a Colorado penal colony. This confirmed that Joy preferred local trips. I told my lawyer about my intentions, and he assured me that he would be able to settle all legal aspects. Now all I had to do was wait patiently for Joy to come to her senses. Two weeks passed, and Joy was finally ready for police questioning. I watched Detectives Phillips and Albert closely as they walked to her room. The reason for the interrogation was Garrett's arrest while trying to withdraw money from Joy's bank account using a stolen card. His parole officer was interested in his unauthorized trip to Vail, and the Denver police sought to keep him in custody. When Phillips and Albert entered Joy's room, I stayed in the hallway taking on the role of detective. Hugh ordered me to eavesdrop on their conversation. Despite the initial denial, the truth eventually came out when she was presented with evidence of her connection to Cal and Garrett. Joy reluctantly confessed to both affairs, but did not dare to tell that Garrett tormented her. Just when I thought there couldn't be any more surprises, Phillips planted a bomb. Phillips urged Joy to confess, implying that it would help repair the damage done to our relationship. I was skeptical, but then Joy finally confessed. She confessed that she lied to attend Garrett's sister's funeral out of pity for me. Despite the betrayal, they both still loved each other. But Joy couldn't ignore the fact that she had feelings for me, too. At Garrett's suggestion, they began holding secret monthly meetings. At first, Joy saw nothing wrong with this and agreed to participate. During one of these meetings, she talked about her affair with Cal, sharing that the mystery of their meetings turned her on. She expressed guilt that I didn't know anything and said she gave me Miami to get better. Her smug attitude infuriated me, and things got even darker when she told me about the night Garrett attacked her. Joy informed Garrett that she plans to stop taking the pills so that we can start a family and have children. Shocked, Garrett suggested that he should have a chance to impregnate Joy, not me. When Joy flatly refused, he lost his temper. Then the conversation turned to another topic. Phillips asked about Jiminy Cricket's tattoo, perhaps wanting to distract from the disturbing turn of events. Oh, Garrett suggested getting a tattoo. He said it was a way to spend time with me without Roger finding out, Joy said. At that moment, I came in. Oh, baby. Hi, baby. I'm so sorry. Can I talk to you? Joy said fearfully. I handed her a stack of documents. No need. You've already been served. I replied calmly. I heard her scream as I was leaving to start a new chapter in my life. Five years later, I was woken up by a late-night phone call. Having gathered the necessary information, I left without saying a word. I kissed my sleeping wife tenderly and then gently touched her growing belly. I reminded myself to be careful not to start something that I couldn't finish. I was looking forward to becoming a father. Half an hour later, I reached the crime scene, 
which I knew well from my work in the patrol. It's been five years since my divorce from Joy, a decision that I thought would be simple, but in fact it turned out to be completely different. Ignoring her attempts at communication led to her hiring a lawyer to represent her interests. While studying her financial documents, I noticed a secret account that raised questions about its financing. One day I unexpectedly crossed paths with Cal Davis, who initially tried to avoid me but eventually accepted my invitation to lunch. During our lunch break, he broke the sensational news to me. Joy had been secretly hiding more than $120,000 worth of unregistered income in a hidden account for the past six years. Shocked by this discovery, I decided to transfer $30,000 of this money to our joint account without Joy's knowledge, planning to have a conflict conversation with her later. In offering a fair solution, I offered to split our total bill equally. But Joy surprised me by offering to give me 75% of all our assets, believing that she was being generous since I wasn't demanding half of the house she inherited. My lawyer quickly pointed out that since Joy already owned the house, she had the right to keep it for herself. In the end, we came to an agreement to split the joint account and my business in half. I quickly signed the agreement, which was then filed in court. She wrote me a check for half of our balance. I sold my part of the masonry business back to my uncle for the same amount I originally paid. The tools I owned before my marriage were confiscated. After selling the business, I went to college and got a degree in criminal justice. When I joined the El Paso County Sheriff's Department, I made sure with the help of a lawyer that all my financial transactions were legitimate. Joy's smile turned into a frown when she found out that her hidden account was empty. My accountant used questionable tactics to create the impression that all the money in Joy's account came from her insurance and my business. I paid all my taxes and was fine, but Joy unknowingly funded my education. On a tip from the IRS, Joy was checked, and as a result, she served six months for tax evasion. After violating his parole and assaulting Joy, Garrett received 35 years in prison. Katrina ended her marriage to Cal and moved to Utah to start a new life. After her release, Joy found a job at a telemarketing company. Later, she sent me an offended letter in which she accused me of the collapse of our marriage and that I had deceived her and Garrett. Ignoring her accusations, I threw the letter away and moved on. Paul made an unpleasant joke that he would sell her to a brothel, to which I replied that she would like it. I spent my first three years working in law enforcement patrolling in the sheriff's department. While CSPD deals with major crimes, our team was often assigned to handle domestic crime cases. I remember one case. The only time I had to use a service weapon was when a woman threatened me with a knife when I arrested her husband for hitting her. It's been a year and a half since that incident, and I've been working as a detective for a little over a year. I've always wondered why some women choose to return to abusive partners, especially when I see firsthand how devastated they are. I remember one case where a woman was left in a state of agony, surrounded by empty beer bottles. Forensics has already collected evidence, including fingerprints and photographs. By the end of the day, I found out my husband's name and started looking for him. The woman's boyfriend was found in the bedroom with a fractured skull, which left two possible suspects, either the husband or the boyfriend himself. To gather more information, I decided to spend the morning going through old reports and talking to officers who had already been in this trailer. The advantage of this situation is that I will most likely criticize my boss less for losing a detective indefinitely. Recently, a new detective joined my team, and the only information I have is that he came from the North. At a party in a bar next to our substation, I was surprised to see Desiree Phillips, and we started talking. I knew that some detectives were unhappy with my close relationship with the new detective, but we had our own unique bond. At first I didn't pay attention to her because I thought she was married. When we got closer and I found out that she wasn't married, I still refrained from courting. I became disillusioned with the relationship and perceived our dates as friendly gatherings, not as dates. I always tried to treat her with respect, gave her a ride after dinners and movie shows like a true gentleman. 
One day after a particularly difficult case, I invited her to a bar, making sure she stayed sober to ensure her safety. At the end of the evening, I walked her home and helped her take off her shoes. When she hugged me, I carefully pulled away, not wanting to risk our friendship. Surprisingly, she wasn't as drunk as I thought. Why don't you want to touch me, Roger? She asked. First of all, you're drunk, I explained. I don't want to jeopardize our connection. Secondly, I'm not sure I'm ready, I added. Has this cheater ruined your mood so much that you think all women are evil? She asked. No, you're one of the most wonderful, I assured her. Come with me, I'm not drunk. There were only four guys in my life. You know all the details, Desiree said. She confessed to me that she had feelings for me since our first meeting in Vale. It never occurred to her that I would work in law enforcement. When she was transferred, it was like fate. That evening marked the beginning of a series of nights we spent together. A year later, we tied the knot, and soon after that our first child was born. My boss was unhappy with her maternity leave, and unfairly blamed me. I teased my colleague Hugh about making Nora the godmother of our child, but he wasn't thrilled with the idea. He also wasn't thrilled that I took a month off to be with my newborn son. Desiree has a deep passion for films about the Second World War. She enjoys watching them and appreciates the historical context they provide. Reflecting on her life, she hopes that Piper will adjust well to life with us. Intuition convinces Desiree that Piper will live well in a new environment. Life is good, and she is optimistic about the future.